science refuses to accept, yet which thousands of people swear to have seen with their own eyes. Every loch in Scotland isn't talking about having a monster in it. Loch Ness is talking about having a monster in it. As we go in search of history, we'll examine the timeless mysteries surrounding the elusive Loch Ness Monster. Deep in the human psyche, there lies a need to believe in something fantastic, something powerful, be it God, ghost, or monster. Such enigmas lie at the heart of the Great Glen of Scotland. This 60-mile crevice, formed by the awesome flow of glaciers over 10,000 years ago, pierces the Scottish Highlands from coast to coast. At the center of this ancient glen lies a mysterious body of water 22 miles long and 700 feet deep. It's called Loch Ness. The folkloric tales of the ancient Highland Scots are filled with accounts of strange beasts called Kelpies or water horses. These ghostly figures make their homes in rivers and locks, and according to the lore, disguise themselves as horses, then wait patiently by the shore to lure innocent mortals onto their backs. And what then happens is the rider finds himself stuck to the horse, and the horse then plunges into the, the depths of the loch, taking the unsuspecting traveler with them. The first written record of an actual Kelpie sighting dates from 565 AD, when the Christian saint Columba, while trying to convert barbaric Scottish Picts to his religion, is reported to have saved a swimmer in the River Ness from the jaws of such a beast. The blessed man raised his holy hand, saying, Thou shalt go no further, nor touch the man. Then at the voice of the saint, the monster fled more quickly than if he'd been pulled back with ropes. Personally, I find it interesting that there is a written record of a water monster in, of all rivers, the River Ness at that time. So I'm, I'm saying it's interesting, but let's not take it for gospel just because it's written by a saint. Scottish historians from the 18th and 19th centuries also chronicled such intriguing anomalies as waves without wind, fish without fin, and even a floating island in both Loch Ness and Loch Lomond. Then, in 1933, Loch Ness and its monster entered the modern age. On April 14, 1933, Mr. and Mrs. John McKay were driving home along Highway 98 on the northeast side of the lock. Gazing out of the window, Mrs. McKay noticed a strange commotion in the water. Fifty-two years later, she vividly recalls the incident. It just rose out of the water, black, wet, with the water rolling off it. And I yelled at my husband, stop, the beast. Word of the McKay's sighting soon reached Alex Campbell, the local water authority and part-time correspondent for the Inverness Courier. And he put in a report that a mysterious monster, possibly the Great Kelpie, uh, had been seen uh, in Loch Ness. And so it grew, a sort of, a monstrous myth was born at that time and grew in newspapers. Soon more sightings were reported in the local papers. Most described several undulating humps on the surface of the water. Some were of a single hump, similar to an upturned boat, sometimes stationary, sometimes moving purposefully. Other witnesses added details like flippers or a tail, and in a few cases, 
a head and neck. In October, the larger British newspapers picked up the story. Within weeks, Nessie was a worldwide sensation, offering a welcome distraction from the grim economic and political news of the era, and sparking an international debate on the possible origins of such a beast. A prehistoric creature called the plesiosaur had been offered to explain scores of sea serpent sightings from the 18th and 19th centuries. Could a similar animal have entered Loch Ness from the open sea? Even those who scoffed at the notion of a prehistoric reptile were hard pressed to suggest anything more plausible. Many witnesses thought the speed and movement resembled an eel but no eel known to man exceeds eight or 10 feet in length. A whale would certainly meet the size requirements, but it would be impossible for an animal of that size to enter the Caledonian Canal system, which joins several locks across the Great Glen of Scotland from the Atlantic Ocean to the North Sea. The favorite explanation was that a seal had entered the lock and stayed to feed on salmon. But seals are curious animals and not at all shy of humans. The monster seemed just the opposite. There were other more cynical theories. Rumors spread that the whole business was a deliberate deception perpetrated by locals to boost tourism. Other skeptics thought it was simply a case of mass delusion. They're looking around, where is this monster? All sorts of stimuli can be seen, ob anomalous objects can be seen on Loch Ness, and of course they are prone to be misinterpreted by those who aren't familiar with them. So there is a strong psychological factor here. People see what they want to see. If it wasn't a trick of the mind or the tourist industry, why were dozens of people claiming to have seen this huge resident of the Loch only now, after years of virtual silence. The recent construction of a highway around the lock was one answer. Prior to that, if you drove what little road there was, it was obscured mainly by bushes, trees, and so on, so that very little areas could be observed. Now, if you drive around the lock, you can see into it for most of the, of, of the distance around the lock, which is of the order of 60 miles. On December 6, 1933, the first purported photograph of the monster appeared in two London newspapers, including the Daily Record. The photographer, a local man, told reporters he was walking lockside when an object of considerable dimensions rose out of the water about 200 yards away. Various popular newspapers of the day offered prizes for a photograph of Nessie. And of course, once you offer prizes for something, you tend to get it. Within a week, the first motion pictures of something purported to be the monster appeared in British newsreels. Not to be outdone, the Daily Mail announced in December that it had employed big game hunter and movie director Marmaduke Weatherall. The colorful Weatherall's mission was to track the monster to its lair. He's a sort of high profile sort of character who likes to put himself about, have his name in the newspaper, um, uh, and the Daily Mail obviously think he's the man to drum up a, you know, an interesting story for them. Uh, which he does uh, very quickly. We saw this great neck emerge from the water, at least uh, about five feet, we estimate, above the water at an angle. Head and neck seem to be one, moving slowly towards the middle of the lock, very rather slowly, uh, for about 20 seconds. We never caught sight of the humps, but this great neck moving along, then it moved down with a sideways kind of motion, disappeared. And we hadn't drunk a drop of whiskey that morning. Amidst great pomp and fanfare, 
Big game hunter Marmaduke Weatherall and his entourage descended upon the shores of Loch Ness in December of 1933. It seemed the Daily Mail had chosen the right man to stalk the elusive monster when, within days of his arrival, Weatherall announced his discovery of a mysterious footprint by the water's edge. There are raised eyebrows at the time by the locals because people think, well, this chap's either very lucky or he's very, very good. A plaster cast of the print was sent to the British Museum for analysis just before the long Christmas and New Year holiday. The much publicized discovery brought monster mania to an all-time peak in the Scottish Highlands. The nearby city of Inverness was floodlit for the first time in history. Tourists poured into the area from all over the world, their cars jamming the narrow road circling the lock itself. Then, on January 6th, the bubble suddenly burst. Zoologists at the British Museum announced that Weatherall's vaunted footprint was indistinguishable from the footprint of a young female hippopotamus and a mounted specimen at that. You see, it's a shriveled up hunting trophy. And we know, of course, Weatherall's got a house full of these things, you know? <laughs> For many who had been keeping an open mind, this was the last straw and confirmed what was already suspected that the Loch Ness Monster was nonsense drummed up by the newspapers. When the Daily Mail pulled the plug on the expedition, the only one surprised was Weatherall himself. He was piqued by the way he was treated by the Daily Mail. He was somebody who liked to be in the limelight. The Mail didn't even report that the expedition was over. It was one of these things that just, you know, ends with a whimper rather than a bang. The embittered Weatherall retreated for the time being, but it took only a few months for the Daily Mail to return to the hunt by publishing the photograph destined to become the most famous of all. The surgeon's photo, as it came to be called, was taken by a respected London gynecologist named R.K. Wilson, who, with uncommon reserve, claimed only to have taken a picture of something unusual in the lock. So either that photograph is of a genuine animal, really, on Loch Ness, or it's a hoax. Looking at that photograph, you could not see how anybody could have made a mistake. There is a beautiful classic image of an upraised head and neck. It is the image that everybody has of the Loch Ness Monster. The first head and neck image of the monster, the amazing surgeon's photo, reassured believers worldwide and even gave the most ardent skeptics a moment of pause a publicity-shy London gynecologist had brought Nessie back to life. But on the other side of the North Sea, there was a very real monster on the rise, a man named Adolf Hitler. During World War II, tourist travel on the lock was restricted but locals and allied personnel stationed there continued to report sightings, logging in 11 specific occurrences during 1941 alone. In 1943, Lieutenant Commander Russell Flint was motoring a boat full of British soldiers through Loch Ness when he had a close encounter with the monster. It was a gorgeous sunny day. We were heading south from Inverness when there was the most terrific jolt. Everybody was knocked back. And then we looked forward, and there it was. A very large animal form which disappeared in a flurry of water. It was definitely a living creature. Certainly not debris or anything like that. Commander Flint duly reported the incident to Admiralty headquarters. Regret to inform your lordships, damage to the starboard bow following collision with the Loch Ness Monster. Life around the lock returned to normal after the war. In 1952, 
Ronald McIntosh was traveling with his family on the north side of the lock, heading toward Inverness. I just happened to look and saw this huge commotion in the loch. So we stopped the car, got out, and uh, this huge object, the size I would describe of a bus, flipped over, just absolutely flipped over in the middle of the loch. And that's all I actually saw, but I definitely saw an object. It was definitely something, whatever you like to call it. I obviously would call it the monster. <laughs> The public was primed for Nessie's return when in 1952, a live coelacanth was captured off the coast of Madagascar. If this living dinosaur, presumed extinct for two million years, could elude science, why should there not be others? In 1960, legitimate science finally took up the challenge. A joint expedition of Cambridge and Oxford universities came to Loch Ness armed with echo-sounding gear. This expedition succeeded in determining that the loch could support a group of large predators. That same year, Tim Dinsdale, a British aerospace engineer obsessed with the mystery, decided to launch his own one-man expedition. On April 23rd, his sixth day on the lock, Dinsdale's 16 millimeter motion picture camera captured a large triangular shaped hump as it moved across the lock. Would this piece of celluloid finally provide the definitive evidence for which monster hunters had been waiting since 1933? Right in the center of the bay between this headland where the castle and the far one was this large lump it looked very much like a boat that had turned upside down. I glanced at it a couple of times and thought, what's that? And then I thought, oh, it's Nessie. About time I saw it. I've been living here a year. In April of 1960, British aerospace engineer Tim Dinsdale became an overnight media sensation when he released to the world 16 millimeter film of what he believed to be the Loch Ness Monster. These few feet of celluloid re-energized the growing community of Nessie believers. When Jarek, the photographic analysis unit of the Royal Air Force, concluded that the Dinsdale hump was indeed an animate object, measuring over 12 feet long and three feet high, many argued that the long-awaited photographic proof of the monster was finally in hand. Still, the critics wouldn't be silenced. Some insisted that the Jarek analysis was flawed and that Dinsdale actually filmed a small fishing skiff. It was known that the farmer actually crossed Loch Ness with a board motor in a dinghy at about that time. But of course, Dinsdale was looking for a monster. He spent 10 days or so looking for it. And what he saw eventually was convincing to him that it was the monster he sought. I, I challenge anyone to look at the a good print of the Dinsdale film and conclude that what he's filming there and what you're seeing is a boat. Despite the controversy, Tim Dinsdale was to become the Pied Piper of a new generation of monster hunters. In 1961, war hero and esteemed member of parliament, David James, and a cadre of passionate volunteers formed the Loch Ness Investigation Bureau, or LNI, dedicated to proving the beast's existence. It was a generation of protest, and many of the volunteers of the Loch Ness Investigation, I think, were here every bit as much to discredit established science as, as to solve a zoological mystery. So it was a sort of a, I almost see it is a bit of a protest movement in the 1960s, a vindication of human nature over academic arrogance. James and his team logged over 10,000 hours of surveillance every summer. Yet the more they watched, the more they learned about the potentially deceiving natural phenomenon of the lock itself. On warm days with flat, calm water, often called Nessie weather, 
Inversion layers cause mirages that can distort and magnify ordinary objects or animals. Roy Mackel, a biochemistry professor from the University of Chicago, fell prey to such an illusion when he first volunteered as an LNI photographer observer. I thought, finally, I'm seeing the animal and I'm getting it on film. It's a head and neck. And to my chagrin, in due course, the animal surfaced, head neck popped up, its body showed, and it flapped off into the sky. So it was a fishing cormorant. So immediately I realized that, especially if there had been a mirage effect, this could be a typical head neck sighting. Local fishing boat skippers like Gordon Menzies can attest to peculiar displays of fluid dynamics that occur regularly on the surface of the lock. If you've got a set of weights coming this way and you cut across it, as the two of them are moving across each other, so the tops are flipping, so it looks as if there's actually something alive on the surface. The new evidence led LNI researchers to conclude that a majority of the sightings in the 1930s were probably just honest mistakes. And so the more experienced you become of the water conditions of Loch Ness, the less Loch Ness monsters you see. In 1967, Roy Mackle himself took over as the director of the Loch Ness Investigation Bureau. Mackle was determined to attack the problem with sound scientific methods. Drawing on eyewitness data and his own experience as a biochemist, he created a menagerie of hypothetical monsters based on major animal groups. I took all of the evidence, not just the physical description, which would you could call an identikit, but the environment, the temperature, the food supply that was available, all those, those aspects, and the reported behavior patterns. And almost has to be a mammal when you consider the ability to expend energy in cold water. Supporting evidence for Mackel's mammal hypothesis came in 1967 when an LNI cameraman captured the strongest motion picture evidence since Dinsdale. Experts at Jarrick estimated that the visible portion of the object at the head of the wake was between five and nine feet, far longer than any known animal at the lock. Unlike the object on the Dinsdale film, this monster clearly rises and submerges in the water. Only small portions were showing. And this would be the kind of example of a fish feeder that was tracking fish as food, swimming as rapidly as possible. I mean, it makes perfect zoological sense. It doesn't mean that that's the case, but at least it's, an, it's a reasonable interpretation of the film. Under Mackel's leadership, support flowed to the lock in the form of corporate sponsorship. More funding meant more sophisticated methods. The most promising new avenue of research was sonar. But the skeptics pointed to the basic flaws of sonar technology as an explanation. A Loch Ness is like a trench uh, with nearly vertical walls, and so sonar is going to be bouncing back and forward from these walls and from the bottom. It's not, therefore, a very reliable tool for exploring a lake, and especially not Loch Ness. In 1969, the six-man submarine Pisces and its crew reported sonar contact with a large moving object and approached within 100 yards before the target receded and disappeared. In the end, the peat-stained water of Loch Ness proved a formidable enemy, limiting visibility, even with strong lights, to just a few yards. Three-quarters of the way across this bay, something just went for about 10 seconds through against the waves, putting up quite a wash as it hit each wave. So it just went poof, 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 against the waves. And all we could see was the water being thrown up. 
And we both stood there in amazement. It's like, what the, what's that going through there? And then by that time, it's gone. It was that brief. In 1971, the Loch Ness Investigation Bureau permanently closed its doors. Its hunt ending in a matter reminiscent of big game hunter Marmaduke Weatherall's back in the 30s, with a whimper, not a bang. Had this ambitious and expensive quest been merely a grandiose folly? We would all like to find a real life dragon. And as long as there are people looking at Loch Ness and seeing things they don't understand, that dragon will live. As some dragon slayers retreated, new ones took their places on the field, armed with even more impressive weaponry. The hunt for Nessie now moved underwater. At the forefront of that effort was the Academy of Applied Science, or AAS, led by a Boston attorney and MIT graduate named Robert Rines. And he brought time-lapse cameras, um, flash cameras, to Loch Ness and moored them, um, firing the strobe light into the dark. An underwater ambush, if you like. The AAS designed an ingenious method for taking a snapshot of the Loch Ness monster. A stroboscopic camera rig and floodlight positioned underwater would alert the team to anything passing through its beam. For two years, Rhines and his AAS colleagues waited as their camera hung suspended in the murky depths. Then, early one August morning in 1972, a wide swipe of ink appeared suddenly on the Echo Trace printer. Something very large was moving through the sonar beam. The AAS rushed their film to Pasadena's Jet Propulsion Laboratory for computer enhancement. The results were astonishing. Two of the stills yielded remarkable images of a flipper-shaped object apparently cruising past the camera lens. Energized by their success, the Academy of Applied Science returned to the lock with an improved camera rig in 1975. The result was a new set of photos, which were destined to cause a firestorm of controversy. The first photograph, after computer enhancement, seemed to show a body with a long neck and head. The second photo was analyzed by a noted zoologist who claimed that the object showed signs of bilateral symmetry, suggesting eye ridges, nostrils, or other protuberances. Could this grotesque shape, this gargoyle head, be the first close-up of the face of the Loch Ness Monster? Former LNI head Roy Mackle was not convinced and warned his colleagues that jumping to premature conclusions could jeopardize the credibility of the entire hunt. I think enthusiasm got ahead of the game a little bit, and some of the things that were photographed turned out to be mistakes. I said, this cannot have anything to do with any of these animals in Loch Ness. Yet the creature's fans were not to be dissuaded. That very same year, nearly 200 scientists, reporters, and members of parliament gathered at the House of Commons to hear Robert Rhines, Mackle, and others present their evidence. More than 40 years after her mystery began, Nessie would finally have her day in court. What happened is we each made our presentation with the emphasis being on the Rhine's photographs, the actual screening of those pictures and the discussion, uh, the, the details of how those were obtained, the size, shape, and all that sort of thing. These earnest Nessie researchers were besieged with ridicule and criticisms. Scientists from the British Museum insisted that the photographs did not constitute acceptable evidence of the existence of a large living animal. 
the upshot was that, you know, the monster people went away thinking, oh, well, you know, we did our best and these stuck-in-the-mud scientists won't, won't believe us. You know, what can we do? And then it all went quiet. I saw an object that I would describe as whale-like surface. And we watched it just track right across the loch. And the interesting thing is that this, to my knowledge, is the longest corroborated view, absolutely authentic, with seven witnesses uh, that I know of. Over the years, a long list of hoaxers and opportunists have capitalized on the Nessie legend with faked photographs and film that commanded big money from tabloids and tourists. Even more damage has been done when well-intentioned scientists allowed enthusiasm to distort their perception. In the 1980s, Robert Rhines and the experiments which produced the much-touted gargoyle head photo drew fire from skeptics and true believers alike. For me personally, as a diver and as an underwater worker, I recognized those pictures as the bottom of Loch Ness, you know, the bottom of the loch. I couldn't see what all the fuss was about. Investigators soon found several serious lapses of methodology and interpretation in Rhine's photographic and sonar data. The camera rig, which Rhine's had claimed was, was steady at that time, was in fact rolling about on the bottom of Loch Ness and picking up pictures of all sorts of things, including the bottom of his own boat. The picture that uh, is alleged to show a gargoyle head is more debris on the bottom of Loch Ness. And if you rotate this picture through 90 degrees, it'll be clearly seen that it is debris on the bottom. A few years later, a diver explored the site and discovered a tree stump on the loch floor bearing a strong resemblance to the infamous gargoyle head, right down to its bilateral symmetry. Then came the most damaging revelation, that overzealous magazine editors had retouched with an airbrush the famous 1972 flipper photos. Now, um, for that to happen at all is all wrong. Um, if it happened just in a newspaper or magazine, that would be something. But when it's getting into sort of textbooks on the subject, I can't believe that Bob Rhines or somebody at the Academy couldn't say, well, look, you've got, the, you've got the wrong image there. This is a very serious negative effect because once these are just, the more discredited evidence you have, the more people are inclined to reject everything. With Rhines himself now doubting the validity of his photos, the hunt for the Loch Ness Monster lost much of its hard-won scientific credibility. Then in 1994, independent researchers Alastair Boyd and David Martin uncovered some startling evidence about the most potent and convincing of all Loch Ness icons, the previously incontrovertible surgeon's photo. A trail of suspicion that led back to, of all people, the Daily Mail's first hired monster hunter and hippopotamus foot hoaxer, Marmaduke Weatherall. Weatherall, furious at the Daily Mail for unceremoniously dumping him after his infamous trickery was uncovered, set out to wreak his revenge. Boyd and Martin learned from his two sons that Weatherall conspired with them to fashion a two-foot monster out of a toy submarine. He simply did this just to amuse himself. He got his own back on the Daily Mail in his own way. He said, well, they wanted their picture of a monster. Let's give them one. You know, let's give them one. Film in hand, Weatherall now needed a solid, upstanding citizen who could claim to have taken the photograph. A fellow conspirator had a friend who liked to play practical jokes, respected gynecologist Robert Kenneth Wilson. 
Yes, he was a surgeon. Yes, he had a lot of letters after his name, but he did like a practical joke. This is the guy to, to front this photo for you. All of a sudden, in April, the Daily Mail get offered this wonderful head and neck photograph of the Loch Ness Monster, not by Marmaduke Wetherill, but by a London surgeon called Robert Kenneth Wilson. And they, they go for it, hook, line and sinker. Although he has proven the most cherished Nessie image to be nothing but a vengeful prank, Alastair Boyd maintains that he has not killed the Loch Ness Monster. On the contrary, he claims to have indisputable proof that it exists. He swears he saw the creature with his own eyes. After the thing swept round, this hump came rolling forward. So it's this, there's this huge hump, which is like, like looking at a whale, 20 foot of this thing, just sitting there on the surface, just over 100 yards from us. It's like, it's extraordinary. You cannot believe your eyes. You're looking at something which is in no textbook in the world on natural history. There's, no, there's nothing in Loch Ness bigger than a big salmon or, a, or an otter. There's nothing, there's no huge animal more than 20 feet long, it, according to, you know, establishment science. It doesn't exist. You're looking at something that doesn't exist. And there it is, you know, large as life, and it's extraordinary. Alastair Boyd still studies the lock, convinced someone will soon uncover proof of the animal's existence. Meanwhile, researcher Adrian Schein was determined to shift the emphasis of the investigation from the abnormal to the normal. The first step in Shine's effort to legitimize Loch Ness research was Operation Deep Scan, a line of 19 powerboats equipped with echo sounders which moved like a minesweep operation down the entire 22-mile length of the loch. Part science, part publicity stunt, it became one of the biggest media events of 1987. But Nessie was not far from everyone's mind. We used it as another sort of mind-sweeping exercise. We were sweeping Loch Ness safe for science. That's what we were up to. On day one, Operation Deep Scan detected three large objects in open water, which could not be found or identified later. But on day two, there were no unusual sonar hits. And what I ended up saying, unpopularly, was that there weren't any 30-foot plesiosaurs in Loch Ness after all, oh, groans, that there were, if there was anything behind it at all, maybe there were some big fish involved. And that was about as far as I could go at the time. I, of course, have the benefit of finding so much else in Loch Ness to interest me. And perhaps I slew my dragon. I might take a personal satisfaction in that, but I don't expect anybody else to thank me for slaying theirs. Others insist that deep scan prove nothing except that the animals are sensitive to disturbances in their habitat, which explain the lack of hits on day two. It's not a no-go area anymore. I mean, all right, they aren't looking for Nessie, but it, it is becoming safe for science. And the more that it uh, becomes safe for science, the more chance there is that ultimately uh, this will lead to research which will prove these animals' existence. And I mean, anything that does that, I'm very much in favor of. The awe-inspiring beauty of Loch Ness attracts more visitors today than at any time in its history. And one thing hasn't changed since the Nessie heyday of the 1930s, the lure of an encounter with the unknown. People come to this mystical spot, hoping to glimpse the Loch Ness monster. And every year, a few more do. No idea what it was. It was certainly a living creature of some description, 
but what it was, you, your guess is as good as mine. We like to think it was the monster. <laughs> I get no thanks for telling this to anybody. I don't make any profit, nothing like that. It's just I'm just telling the fact of what I actually saw. From the evidential value, I have the satisfaction of giving you date, time and place. And with seven other witnesses, now in a court of law, I would get the impeachment of the President of the United States on that evidence. That's what keeps me fascinated. There's something big here. I want to be involved in finding out what it is. For many, the mystery of the Loch Ness Monster remains intact. And maybe that's how it should stay. The riddle is often more fascinating than the solution for those who go in search of history.